did you work on your projection? Projecting. Uh -huh. Might be good. No, I can just, you're good. I I can okay. To it. So, again, welcome to the Columbia Museum of Art. Uh, I'm Carrie Culkin Hornsby, and I'm thrilled to have Henry with us today to speak about the exhibition which he made specifically for our museum. But even before that, Henry's family has a long history in South Carolina and a unique connection to our museum. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? You might know more about it than me, but... Uh, well, let's see. But, <laughs> so, of course, my family is from Columbia, and my parents uh, immigrated to Charleston uh, before. The story is that, uh, that they were crossing a bridge, maybe it was the Cooper Bridge, or maybe it was the Ben Sawyer Bridge, to, and uh, the, the, the family lore is that by the time they were over the bridge, uh, my mother had told my father that they were to be married. <laughs> well, there's, but anyway, um, we're from Columbia, we have long roots here, and in fact, uh, I believe the first Columbia Museum of Art was in the Taylor House, which was in the house of my great-great-grands. I'm not very good with that sort of thing. So yes, we are uh, um, an old South Carolina family. Actually, Edmund could probably fill in more details than, uh, than I know. Um, I tend to concentrate on, uh, on researching issues that I'm working on. Um, so that's where my, I'm not such a, sadly, not enough of a reader of history and more a reader of, um, of environmental documents and, and current event documents. So, yeah. Yeah, so, but you got your start in photography in Charleston, so this exhibition is a little bit like a homecoming. Um, this is, it's more than a little bit like yeah. a homecoming. It was, I, I, I did, I started taking pictures at, at probably when I was 15 and have done it ever since, um, doing what everyone does, doing pictures of people on the street. Um, in Charleston, I was always fascinated with, with older people and black people because somehow the margins of the society seem to tell a lot about the society. Um, and all of my work is about people, one way or another. It's about, even though these are all landscapes, they're, each one of these pictures is a story, each one of these pictures encapsulates a story that is ultimately about people, about how we live on the coast and what we're doing with the coast. And um, yeah, and even my pictures of pollution, the series before this was a series of abstract expressionist pictures of toxic waste. But really it's pictures about the, the residue of, of the things we buy every day and what that residue does to us as, you know, the fact that we burn coal to make electricity means that we can't eat the fish in our rivers. And that's not okay. I was talking to one of the docents outside and she said, I'm so glad you said that. You know, in our world, um, the environment has been, and environmentalists have been cast as a special interest group to be therefore balanced against the other special interest groups. Yeah, I mean, if environmentalists are a special interest group, if the people that want clean air and clean water are a special interest group, well then their interests should be balanced against the interests of the coal burners, right? Of the Koch brothers. Well, I mean, the coal burners, they have interests too, and the environmentalists have interests, and therefore we should balance those interests, right? Am I? No, that's completely wrong. The environmentalists, the people that want clean air and clean water, that's about our children. That's about, and this show is all about our children. It's about what are we going to leave for, you know, I'm in South Carolina, I realize that, and I'm, 
I'm, I never, I'm never trepidatious about going out on a limb and speaking my mind. This may come as a shock to you. Climate change is real. <laughs> it's real and it's happening fast. I happen, I'm very lucky. I know a lot of you. You knew I was going here. You I did. <laughs> I did. I'm just going to kind of sit back. <laughs> Good. Good now. I'm very lucky. I know a lot of the world's great scientists. And as an aside, I find it fascinating in our world that we have marginalized the very people that we have educated to tell us how the world works. That in itself is a fascinating development of the modern world. But the climate change scientists I know are terrified about the future. They're not scared, they're terrified. They won't even say what their worst case dreams are, what their worst nightmare. I mean, now it's, it's standard. The, the ocean will rise a meter by the end of the century. I said this in, in, to the docents. I'll say it to you here. Columbia is a coastal city. Think about that. Think about that. The last time atmospheric CO2 was at the same level it is now, Columbia was on the coast. The sand hills, those are sand dunes. Those are not, hello darling, those are not, you know, some, some abnormality. Those are sand dunes. The water's coming here to Columbia. I mean, we think, oh, well, that's, no, that's impossible. It's a lot. No, it's not impossible. A dear friend of mine um, is named Maureen Ramo, and she's one of the world's great geologists. And one of her projects recently was actually mapping the exact coastline in South Carolina. Now, she's at, she's at Columbia University, and actually right now, she's in the Arctic mapping the disappearing ice. Anyway, I find that fascinating. Columbia is, South Carolina is the place where that is most, that, that original coastline is most. And of course, I'm a dinosaur, yeah? I'm, I'm 56, I'm out of here. Before, well, probably not, things are gonna get bad quickly. Sorry, we're not, let's, let's change the subject. Okay, let's, let's talk about you. nice things. Let's talk about nice things. So let's pull up, if we can, if I can remember. I know, everybody in the booth is looking at me like, can I do this? Okay. What are we doing, pulling up pictures? Pulling up, what, we're, we're pulling up your beautiful art. So we're gonna talk a bit about this. So you touched on your last series, Industrial Scars. Um, aerial photography as well, abstraction. Um, I would like to talk a bit about how you got um, to that point. What made you go to the sky? Well, I looked at the, at the batiks of Mary Edna Frazier and I said, you know what, I've just got to copy. She's doing something smart. I just got to copy what she does. You know, that's, it's that simple. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, no, I, uh, you know, as an, as an activist, so I started doing these pictures of industrial, they're abstract expressionist pictures of toxic waste, of the stuff that the byproducts of what we what we use every day you know the the coal ash which poisons our rivers is the byproduct of burning coal for electricity and as an activist i can continue the beautiful pictures you can in industrialscars.com um well and the show was at the gibbs museum in charleston gibbs, a few yeah. years and ago some traveling. of you may have seen it's it still it's still going around but as an artist, you've got to do something else. You can't keep doing, as an artist, you can't keep doing the same things over and over because then you, you don't fit in the art world. So I thought What do you to, mean by that, Henry? Well, like everything in our modern world, people say, what are you doing now? Oh, well, I'm doing more of the industrial scars. No, that doesn't work. You've got to be doing... So I thought, okay, what follows logically? What, what can I, as an artist, what can I do next, which logically follows the abstract expressionist pictures of, of environmental issues, and, but, but still addresses the issues that are important to me, which is you know, people, um, 
what our future will be and what do we leave for our children. And it occurred to me that photographing the coastline, especially in America, which, you know, we're a little bit in denial. I don't know how, I mean, I'm sorry to go back to this, but, but you know, Charleston will flood 30 days a year by the year 2020. Noah has, you know, Noah just says it. Charleston will be flooded 30 days a year by the year 2020. So it occurred to me that I should start photographing the coastlines. And um, Henry, for those who don't know what Noah may be. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Noah is both my favorite pilot, <laughs> um, who is named Noah Burns, and but he's now going into the Navy. And NOAA stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. All of our weather reports come from NOAA, um, N-O-A-A. Uh, and again, NOAA predicts that within four years, Charleston will flood 30 days a year. That's a, it's crazy. It's a crazy number. You know, one month a year will be flooded in Charleston. And of course, you, one says to themselves, oh, well, we'll just move to higher ground. But it doesn't work that way, you know, when, when, you know, there will come a tipping point when suddenly people, I mean, Miami's already gone. And the fascinating thing is the real estate values are still going up. You know, Miami is on a karstic formation, which means limestone. Charleston, maybe we could build a seawall, right, like they're doing in Venice. But in Miami, the water just comes up from below because it's all porous limestone. And... Um, yeah, it's fascinating. We're still moving to the coast. We got It's time to start thinking about moving back from the coast. Sorry, I know these are big, heavy topics, but you know, it's time to start thinking about retreating because in North Carolina, I love this, the politics, I love this. In North Carolina, it is against the law. I'm gonna say it slowly because it's so unbelievable. In North Carolina, it is against the law for a state agency to engage in climate change preparedness. Should I repeat that? I mean, it's so unbelievable. I kind of just have to close my mouth when I think about it because it's so, un in North Carolina, there is, they're, they're low, you know? I mean, I've been there, they're in the water. And um, yeah, so because our approach to, you know, when did the weather get politicized? When, when was the, the weather a topic of, you know, okay, it used to be that, that, that you, you could go to a party and the weather was always a safe topic, right? Oh, well, <laughs> been a dry year this year. Um, and now it's no longer because, of course, the weather immediately leads to this taboo topic of, of anyway. Let's talk well, about art. Let, let's talk about art. So, you're very passionate, obviously. No. Just a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. But I want to talk to you about, because I know it was originally um, booked that our chief curator, Will South, was going to be doing this conversation. He uh, could not make it. So, as director of education, I happily stepped in. Because what I want to know and what we're um, focusing on here is something called visual literacy and visual thinking strategies. So how can you look at an image, a work of art? Um, how can you, we're inundated with visual images anymore in these, in these times. More than half the photographs ever taken in the history of photography have been taken within the past like two or three years. So this is a lot of information coming at our children, but everyone. So how can we look at one of your images and um, explore these topics. What can we do? What can we pull from your images? Well, of course, I think that in this, we've, especially in America, but all around the world, you know, now we're all doing this, and we think that this is the world. The world is in this little box. I don't know what you're talking about, Henry. That's right, that's right. Hold on, I'm getting a Wait text. a minute, hold on. And, <laughs> We, we, that what, what's happened, we've lost the ability to talk to each other and to listen to each other and to listen to each other's ideas and come to consensus, yeah? That's, I mean, that's what democracy is all about. And for me, art is a way to bypass that lack of dialogue, which I, I see in our society now. Because 
somebody can look at a picture. Now that's just a beautiful picture, but you know, somebody can look at at a you know a picture of a building falling in the water, and that tells a story, and it's an incontrovertible story. You know, that that building was built where it should not be built, and we as taxpayers will pay for that because federally funded flood insurance allowed that developer to borrow money from the bank and build on that place where he shouldn't build and all those people bought those condominiums and that developer took off with the money and now we as taxpayers will bail those people out of there. Where is this Henry? That's on the Isle of Palms and I used to go the police came and took me off of the Isle of Palms late one night for firing firecrackers and causing all kinds of trouble. I used to roam that beach when there was nothing there. Um, and that's a little bit sad in itself. But art, again, allows, you can't argue with that picture, right? You can, you can argue about the conclusions maybe, but, but you know, and the developer can say, well, you, you know, there, there, there's the issue of, of property rights versus public good, which is always an issue in the U.S. But, you know, you can't argue with that picture. That building is falling in the water, and they can build all the little plastic fences they want to, but the ocean is going to take that building. So someone coming upon this image in the exhibition will immediately be able to understand that something's wrong there. Something's wrong there. Yeah. And then, you know, we encourage them to look deeper and, and then to have this kind of dialogue. Yeah. So that is what um, I love about your photography because there's a wonderful first glance that you, you see a beach and you see an ocean and of course some of these are quite stunning but then you, you look deeper and you understand, you come to understand um, that there's something going on there that, that we either want to protect um, we want to um, encourage other people to learn about it and to be passionate about it. Yeah. Uh, talk Passion is, well, and there's, you know, we, we have something really special here in South Carolina. This coastline is unique. It's, I've been around the world, and what we have here doesn't exist anywhere else. The, the beauty, the wildlife, the, the, you know, the beaches, and... It's hard to, hard decisions have to be made, you know, about, okay, what are we going to do to protect this? And that's... The contrast, show the picture of Captain Sam Split and tell them that they're going to build 50 houses on it. And she's talking about... Now, do, I assume all of y'all know about Captain Sam Spit, which is there. Um, May not. This is on Kiowa Island, and the developers of Kiowa, and now, again, as a kid, I remember, I'm, I'm very lucky. I, when I was 12, I was in a John boat by myself, roaming around these rivers. Now, I went out into the world and assumed that everyone did that, that everyone grew up that way, you know, with a shotgun on their lap and always unloaded. And, you know, in a John boat roaming up the Santee River. Not everyone had that good fortune. Yeah, not everyone in the world grew up doing that. So, and I remember when I was a kid on Kiowa Island and there were six houses out there. Is that the right number? Were there six out on Kiowa? Yeah. And then, of course, the family that owned it, I think the Royals, sold it to the Kuwaitis. And they did what everybody does. They built golf courses and houses. And part of that deal was that they would leave this spit of land alone. Because, you know, I mean, you can see, this is a very unstable piece of land. I've got photographs of it over the years, and Mary Edna probably has more. And it changes all the time. Um, well, so the solution is, let's just pour a bunch of concrete right here so that we can build a road. And so now this has been in the courts for years and bless those groups, those special interest groups <laughs> that are fighting to protect this land. How dare they? How dare they fight those developers? It's been in the courts for years. SELC, Coastal Conservation League, these groups are, are, 
have been battling, you know, I support them, please, you should support them too, because they're battling to protect places like this. And those developers, you know, developers have lots of money and lots of time, and they just keep going back to court and sucking up the, the, the special interest money of groups like the Coastal Conservation League and, you know, who are just fighting, fighting, fighting to keep, I mean, dolphins do something called strand feeding on the backside of this. The, it's unique. The dolphins drive fish up onto that beach to eat. And it doesn't happen anywhere, anywhere else. And, you know, if you build houses there, that stuff goes away. It doesn't stay. You can't, I'm sorry, you can't destroy a habitat. The animals leave. They don't, the animals don't say, oh, yeah, hi, on the beach there. Can we just drive our fish up on the beach and eat? No, they leave and they disappear. They don't go somewhere else. They die. You know, every time you got that nice little device. I do. You know, we don't want to know. Sorry, I'm going back You're into. Good. We don't want to know the consequences of our toys. Yeah, these things are, I don't have one because I know the consequences. A gorilla was eaten so that we could have this magic device. Yeah, we don't want to know that in our, you know, we want to turn on the lights and leave them on and we don't want to think about the fact that that means that mercury rains down into our rivers and that therefore we can't eat the fish. We don't want to make these connections. And that's what my pictures are about, is trying to make these connections. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a battle and it's a beautiful place and it shouldn't be built on. And Well, Henry, you said when you started with photography, <coughs> you took photos of people and that was your interest. Um, I know you live in New York now and have for many I years. I pay taxes in New York. Well, there I live you go. In a suitcase. <laughs> there you go. Um, home is where you pay taxes, I guess. I but guess, yeah. <laughs> how did you make that shift? I know. Um, talk a little bit about uh, your beginnings as a photographer, because I know you did um, many different things. Uh, J.C. Penney catalog, things like that. Before you, <laughs> before you did this. So how did that progression happen? What ignited you to become such an activist? I mean, you're always an artist, have been, it sounds like since you were 15. What ignited this activism in you? Well, I started, um, you know, I've always done, these are, this is a collection of pictures. <laughs> this man is a giant of a man. I, um, one of the things I did was I raised wolves. And for a while, when, I, when we were living in New York City, starting this whole thing, we kept the wolves here in Pennsylvania at his house. And uh, this man, I mean, that's a funny picture, and I love the picture, his name is Lenny. And really, he's, and Lenny is one of those men that just does what needs to be done. I mean, he drives a truck for the Baltimore school system. But you know something? If there was a wolf that was a problem, and really Lenny was a giant of a man, that, that wolf wouldn't mess with Lenny. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of this. These are pictures that I took around the South when I was younger than I am now. Um, New Orleans, this is out in the Ace Basin. Um, this is out on Wadmala Island. That's a picture of my a young friend and I would go and, and buy candy in this store. Um, so yeah, the South has always been a big part of, of my consciousness. And people, again, are always, she raised me. That was my maid as a child. Um, and I'm fascinated by Martin Luther King and this icon of, of I mean, that's, I think that's my next project is going to be the, the, the legacy of slavery um, because it's such a, it's a, it still defines this country. Um, and, you know, pictures like this, young white boy photographing black working men who are a little bit surly about it. Um, so 
I don't know. I, I've always taken pictures of people and loved to photograph people. But then somehow I'm very political. It's clear that I'm very political. Um, now, have you always been, do you think, since, think since so. adolescence? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Yeah. And it's always been informed by, the environment has always been a big topic for me. Because, again, the environment is really, you know, it's a fascinating thing. It goes back to you being the 12-year-old on the John boat. Yeah. Okay. And this, back to the special interest, the environment is basically, we say this word and it has political meaning, but it's really, it's a, it's a, a complex system, God knows how it got here, you know, maybe it was God, I don't know, that gives us free services, right? It's fresh air, it's fresh water, it's fish in the ocean, it's bees to pollinate our plants. And, you know, it's not a political issue, it's, it's a free services issue that we're going to have to pay to replace. Yeah, we'll, when suddenly there's no more clean water, we will have to pay, that's about aluminum. Back to my, remember, one aluminum can, you throw one aluminum can. I away. learned that from you last night, three hours. If you throw away one aluminum needs aluminum is very toxic. If you throw away one aluminum can and don't recycle it, you waste enough electricity to power your computer for three hours. Three hours. And that's a full size computer, not this one. Now, aluminum is all about climate change. Aluminum is about a tremendous amount of toxic waste. Aluminum is about I'm not going to explain it here. Aluminum is about the Iceland economic crisis. It's all driven by aluminum. It's fascinating. And this is really, this one is about Charleston. Even though that's on the Mississippi River, that's the waste from phosphate mining. And Charleston, as many of you know, was the original home of phosphate. Anyway, um, so this is the Industrial Scars series. This is the abstract expressionist pictures of toxic waste. So anyway, what I do, I get up in a plane. Let's, I, I'm going to get off politics. Yes, okay. And I'm gonna, so I hire a plane and I fly over this stuff and look for it because I want to tell stories about these things that affect us all. And talk a bit about the challenge of, um, and the thrill of capturing an image well, it's from really, an airplane. It's really hard. Uh, uh, to you know you're in a plane and you have something in mind to photograph and you're only there for one second because you know planes move very fast and you've got all this equipment and the stress level is very high and you're being buffeted by the wind and um, you know you have one second to make a picture and you have the idea in mind I, this is Charleston seen from the ocean as the storm's coming in um, the screen's a little bright, so it's not as dramatic as it should be. But then you get over there on, um, and, you know, photography is really about being in the right place at the right time and then getting lucky. And here, I arranged with the pilot to get out there, and there was a cold front coming in, a storm coming in, and we just were there, and I was lucky to be there at the right time. And then this light comes through the clouds and lights up the city, and it was perfect. And it was just luck. You know, yes, I was there. Yes, I had a camera. Yes, I got a pilot. But then, you know, God shined a light on the city and, and made a great picture. And, um, yeah, you, the print's really beautiful. The, here, it, the projection doesn't do it justice, but... <laughs> The and to talk about the type of plane you were in. It's not the type you were usually in when that photo was taken, was usually it? Usually, I, I, I'm flying in a Cessna, which is a you know, it's the Volkswagen of airplanes. It's uh, the Cessna 172. You can find them everywhere in the world. On that day, I was flying with a pilot uh, out of Charleston who flies in an old World War II um, surveillance plane, an old Piper Cub, and it's an open. Um, here, I happen to have, uh, it's an open plane, this is my database, and that's him, his name is John Engel, he's, uh, he, and 
literally the, the windows open up and you're just leaning out and photographing. And I should also um, mention, this is Noah and he's the young pilot that uh, flew me for most of these pictures. Because I ended up having, John ended up not having so much time and I needed a pilot that was young and adventuresome and flexible. And so, you know, if it was high tide at dawn, I would call Noah and say, Noah, let's go flying. Um, and so, yeah, I just, you know, the story sort of developed as I did it over the last two years. You know, what are the issues? And, and it's easy for me. I love those patterns of moving water. You know, those, those rice fields and wetlands. Um, but I realized that, um, that that couldn't be the whole show. It had to be about issues, about, you know, this is, I mean, that's the economic engine of South Carolina right there. There's so much economic activity that comes and goes through that, through that port authority. Um, and we talked about the trucks and the, 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 the trucks traffic down and the pollution, but you know our prosperity depends on tourism, which it's easy to hate the tourists, but boy, they bring us a lot of money. And you know this Ports Authority, which is that's because of the Ports Authority, we've got BMW in Greenville, and we've got you know Boeing, and although Boeing flies a lot of their stuff in, but. But and I believe a new, is it a new Volvo? Um, there's a new Volvo plant. And plant coming? Yeah, I yeah. mean, so it's a, these... All, and this is where specifically? Oh, this so is right in Charleston. This yep. is the South Carolina Ports Authority. Um, it's right off of 526, is that right? Yeah, is that how you right, get to it? That's the Wando River that's going up to the right there. Mm -hmm. um, one of the pictures that didn't make it into the show, because I didn't want the show to be... Uh, so, let's see, it's in the catalog, sorry, I'm looking in my, um, my database here, I'm, a, I'm a, a nut for data, is this one, and again, when you see the print, it's really beautiful, I wanted a picture that showed, I love Charleston, I love South Carolina, and even more maybe now that I travel all the time, I wanted a picture that showed that confluence of the two or three rivers, depending on. This is the uh, Ashley River, that's the Cooper River, and that's the Wando. So I see it as three, but my family argues with me and says, no, it's only two. Anyway, um, the confluence of those rivers that, that form this peninsula, that that's such a wonderful place. and it's, it's really, when you see this print blown up big, it's really clear, you can see every house in Charleston. It's really quite special. Um, but I decided that the show couldn't be all about Charleston, so that's why that picture didn't make it into the exhibit. Can you pull up um, the photo of the hurricane shelter that is in the exhibition? Yeah. That's, and, that's in and, this. And talk about um, that maybe a bit. Oh, yes. Um, there is uh, a great writer and historian in Charleston named uh, Richard Porche, who's got a, a new book out about the rice culture. And I went and, and talked to Richard about what, because I always, I always want to ask questions, because you know, I feel like I'm a bit of an idiot, and there's always somebody who knows. And so my goal is always to find the one who knows and and get his or her information so that to inform me what to do. And Richard pointed Richard pointed out things to me uh, that were good would be good subjects. There's this, and there's also um, he he told me where to find these rice smokestacks. Now that will bring up all of the smokestacks in my database. And you don't want to see all the smokestacks in my database because there are a lot. <clears throat> yeah. Look at that. I love a good database, huh? Um, so that is the smokestack from a rice mill, a mill that would Mary Edna straighten me out when I, when I stray off the path. This mill would grind rice, would grind the husks off of rice. Am I right there? Um, 
I'm pretty sure I'm right there. That was a smokestack from a rice mill that would grind the husks off of the rice. And so, yeah, I, this friend of mine, Richard, guided me to a lot of these spots. This is up in Winya Bay, this one. And um, this one, which was a shelter for the slaves who might be caught out in the rice fields when a hurricane would come, that's in Well, the and they're miles and miles from shelter. So. Well, it's a fascinating thing. You know, I ask myself why, um, why South Carolina is such, is such a special coastline. And I've decided it's special for several reasons. Um, and back to people who know more than me, um, uh, Virginia Beach, who is, uh, whose husband Dana is the director of the Coastal Conservation League, wrote a wonderful book about the rice culture, and I learned a lot from that book. And I think one of the reasons that South Carolina coast is so special, there are three reasons that I've identified. One, a lot of it's inaccessible. You just can't get there. Two, those rice plantations, those large plantation holdings locked up a lot of the land, and then three, a lot of rich Yankees came and bought those rice plantations as hunting grounds, and that's preserved a lot of land. And of course then four, which is the, the, the locking up that land in conservation easements. Uh, and those, I think, are the factors which have, have preserved this very magical coastline. Um, but because yeah, it's unique within... It's, it's really special. You know, as, as someone who's traveled the world and, and come back, and back to what you were saying, this, this exhibit is really a, a love song to my homeland. Um, and it's, it's, you don't find this anywhere, certainly nowhere in America, do you find something like what we have on the coast of, of South Carolina. Um, this picture also speaks to me about the contribution of slaves to the economy in America. And, you know, the things we, Michelle Obama said, I'm living in a house made by slaves. And um, that, again, I think that might be my next project is, is what's the legacy of slavery in America. And, and definitely the South yeah. would be a huge component of that, obviously. Yeah. What is this used for now? It's a hunting lodge. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, again, because it's a hunting lodge, it's preserved. And the, the others don't exist anymore. They've all been torn down, the other, the other hurricane shelters. But because this is on land that somebody bought for hunting, it's been preserved and they preserved. turned it into a hunting lodge. I'm but, dying to go. Somebody on Facebook actually... Uh, pinged me and said he's been out there and knows I'd love to go out there. I love so to go this is now. after a, a flood. I mean, the water's high right it's now. It's after a this, hurricane. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've got pictures of this before this hurricane where it's on dry land. Um, yeah. So that is why it was there, because of hurricanes. So, honey, I would like to ask you, because you did do this wonderful project and series of work, but what were your goals with this? Well, you know, my goals are always political. I want people to think Sorry. about these issues. Your, it's your talking magic to me. device is talking I to know. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I want us to consider. We're so lucky, yeah, in South Carolina, and I want us to consider. Okay, how do we preserve this? How do we? And it's though it's it's an easy question and a hard answer. Okay, building codes. You know, we. We shouldn't build on barrier islands, but everybody wants to live on a barrier island. So how do you make that, how do you, you know, how do you, and we've, we've built them out mostly, but there are a couple that aren't built out, and how do, we, how do we act to preserve those? And, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a question that has to be asked. And, you know, as we build, as people rush to the coast, what's the number, 48 per day? Something Is like that, that. 43, I Charleston? think, that moved to Charleston per day. Every day? I mean, you can't build fast enough. These, um, you know, they're that one, and where's the other one? 
that one. Um, are this one of them? The first one's Myrtle Beach, and this one's down by Beaufort. Um, you know, we're cutting down coastal forests to build houses for people that are rushing to the coast to move. And meanwhile, the ocean's rising, and storm activity will increase. So where's the? You know, we're not doing we're not doing good balancing act. Now. Well, this brings to the forefront the idea of a picture is worth a thousand words because you can say to somebody 43 people are moving here a day this is what's going to happen but when they see something like this where obviously the forest has been cut down and, and cleared to make this housing development then those words have more meaning so and let's you know that is um Buford, B-E-A-U, Buford, South Carolina. I never was very good at spelling. Um, so, oh, this is, so that is just the edge. Where, let's see, Google, turn off all those labels. And let's see if I can find that. When you look at it, I do this all the time, looking at Google um at Google Earth and finding, you know, you you zoom in and you look at this development in particular. Is that it? Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with, with zooming around on Google Earth, but that's only a little offshoot. You look at that development and it's gigantic and it it just goes on and on and on and it's growing and it's it's like a cancer, it's eating up the forests. Um, and of course we know that, that natural structures on the coast absorb storm activity. And when we destroy those natural structures and put man-made structures with our investments, well of course then we want to protect our investments. And the storm activity damages them and, and you know, then we call our congressman and say, I want flood insurance. Well, your photographs are reminiscent of paintings of the Hudson River, of Bierstadt out in the west, of how um, the land was 100, 150 years ago. So you are really documenting a moment in time with these photographs. Um, and therefore... Which begs the question, I mean, is art... Art should be universal. Well, let's let's go. You know, n no artist. If you're really an artist, you can you you must build on the art that was done before, right? I mean, you can't. And art is a progression of learning how to represent something. L represent in as a photographer, I'm representing a three dimensional world in two dimensions. And of course, the art I'm I'm drawing on what the what the Renaissance painters learned, yeah, they learned how to how to m make a picture, and of course I'm I'm drawing on that, and by doing aerial photographs, I'm I'm playing with our, our dream of flying. What human didn't dream of flying? I mean, we all did, and. As terrestrial animals, of course, we our brains are programmed to to think about things in terms of the horizon, and by doing aerial photographs, I can play with that horizon and cut the horizon out, as I do here, which makes which suddenly turns a landscape into a graphic a, a, a piece of graphic art, um, and. You know these rules of composition. If you went to, if you studied any art, they're very, you know, they're they're very cut and dried. You know the rule of thirds and the the rules of color. But but they're they're very real, and and I'm playing with those constantly. You know, thinking about how the great painters crafted their work and what that and the great photographers before me. Um, who, who, you know, I don't want to, I must build on them, but I don't want to repeat them. As I told you, this picture of the cars in, um, that are queued up to go to, uh, to wherever they're going to, the BMWs. The shipping. 
yeah. being shipped out. I almost didn't include that because it's been done photographically. And I don't want to repeat what, um, what someone has done before me. I mean, it's a great picture, and, I and it speaks to what's going on on the coast, and so I decided ultimately to, to do it. It's, there's a photographer named Andreas Gursky, who's one of the big photographers in the world at this moment. And, you know, it w one could look at this and say, oh, well, it's a knockoff of Gursky. And in fact, there's a Charleston photographer who's really a great photographer. He's not well enough known, David Soliday. And he did a wonderful exhibit of, he's been photographing the rice fields and the rice culture. And I went out and met with him and I looked at his work and I thought, again, back to, I love these abstracts of marshes and wetlands, but he did that. And I sort of chewed my cud after looking at his pictures. And I, I knew this before I looked at his pictures, but even more after I said, well, this, can't, this exhibit can't be a repetition of what somebody else has already done. It has to be something else. It has to be really a portrait of the coast, warts and all. I mean, you know, the, this is, much of it is beautiful, but there's also, you know, for instance, the picture of the smokestacks. I mean, it, it, it's really important. I was talking, we were meeting with the docents, and I was talking about um, something I did a couple of years ago. I, I got the emissions reports for all the industries around Charleston. You knew I had to come back. I know, that. I know. Around, within 100 miles of Charleston, industry reports that they, admit, that they emit 1,000 pounds of mercury into the air. Now think about that, 1,000 pounds of mercury every year comes up the smokestacks into the air within 100 miles around Charleston. And there's no safe limit. The, that, I mean, that's why we can't eat the fish out of our rivers anymore, because of that mercury. And, you know, that's the, the environment is not a special interest group. I'll stop with that. I'll stop. Well, with you the, know, you keep saying I have to come back to it, but that's what this exhibition is about. That's what this exhibition is And that is why you took these photographs and why you're sharing your art with all of us because of your passion and for all of us to learn. So it's not coming back to it. I think it's what it's about. It's what so, it's about. And it's ingrained well, it's in about, what the images it, are. It's about the beauty and the, and the things that we're doing wrong. I mean, you know. It's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale. It yeah. definitely is. Yeah. Well, I'm going to let some members here in our audience ask a few questions as well. If you're up for that. Absolutely. Are you up for that? Excellent. So if anybody has any questions, we'd love to take them. Might as well start on the right. Might as well start. Oh, the, oh you're right. Um, it's, it's not a question, it's a comment. Your work brings me back to this memory that I've been replaying in my head where I think it was it was at Ohio State University and I think it was the artist Josiah McElhaney in dialogue with one of the scientists at the university who had worked with Al Gore as a consultant on an inconvenient truth and what he does is he takes glacial cores in South America, I think in Peru. And so there are these abstract ice tubes that he said along there you could see where the Clean Air Act was instituted. Really? And and, and, and I always think about that as a beautiful mm. abstract positive change moment and your work making me think of that same kind of Thank it's you. sculpture, basically, but it's telling a story. You know, quick question. Who was the most environmental president in American Jimmy history? Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Richard Nixon. Maybe Roosevelt. Maybe. <laughs> but my point, okay, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act. Now, it might be that Nixon had his feet held to the fire, but, you know, he still signed those acts. What's happened in this country? We've lost the ability to to dialogue and to, you, you know, I come from a family of Republicans. I'm clearly, I'm very liberal. Uh, and, but we have lost the ability to, to realize what a special interest really is and to dialogue with each other and craft solutions. Um, and that's part of what I hope art can do 
mine and anyone else's, art should be able to sidestep dialogue and look at, at eternal truths. And I hope that, that my work in general and this picture, the, this exhibit, will be about that, will be about, hey, this is not about politics, this is about what is, and, you know, now let's, let's adjust our politics to talk about, you know, what our, what our future is. Well, it's great because it's lifting the veil. People, if you think of Charleston or the coast, and rightfully so, because they're beautiful places, you tend to think of all the pleasantries. But there are some things that um, need to be noted and people need to be aware of. So I think it serves a great uh, point to be able to start those discussions. Well, I mean, you know, there's not a Charlestonian. Are any, how many here are from Charleston? So a third of the people. There's not a Charlestonian that doesn't complain about the traffic. I mean, it just doesn't exist. Every, everybody in Charleston bitches and moans about the traffic constantly. But just say, just suggest mass transit. And, you know, the guns come out. I mean, they, nobody wants to, nobody wants to talk about, oh, well, maybe we should have a train. There's, a, there's an old train line that runs down the middle of the peninsula. This is a no-brainer. You run a train, you know, there's a trolley street in Somerville? Do you know why there's a trolley street in Somerville? <laughs> because there was a trolley that went from Somerville down to Charleston. But no one is willing to, you know, we all want to get in our cars and go, by golly. And, you know, as soon as we build a road, they build more houses and then that road is clogged and then we got to build another road and anyway. Um, Yes, more questions? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned you lived in Europe about six months of the year. What's yeah. your interest there? I love culture. <laughs> I think that the highest achievement of, of humans is the culture that we leave behind, whether it's the music or the visual art or whatever. And Europeans value, you know, culture has been debased in this country. We, we don't support it. We don't... It's going out on a limb to say we don't appreciate it, but, but you know, that we give our money to the military. We don't give our, more money goes to marching bands, to military marching bands in this country than orchestras. I mean, most cities in America don't have orchestras anymore. I don't know, does Columbia have a symphony now? We do. In, but, you know, in Europe, every town has a great orchestra. Every town, you go to a big city and there'll be three or four. And so I love that. I love culture. I love music. I love art. And I love being in Europe and being able to hop on a train and go to the next city. And yeah, so that's why I'm a lot in Europe. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think earlier you said you, you, have you photographed the coast of, down in Louisiana. Yeah. Um, I heard this morning on the radio, they were talking about, you also said that you use Google Maps all the time. All the time, yeah. Well, they were saying on, on NPR this morning that the cartographers can't keep up with the ocean encroachment, and they're seeing that particularly right now in Louisiana with what's going on down there. And I was just wondering if you had noticed that when you were oh, using yeah. your maps and, and what you actually saw. Well, I haven't noticed the disappearance of the land, but I read about because. I'm not there often enough. You'd have to photograph it. For instance, Captain Sam Spit, I've photographed over the years. I can see it's changed. But I've read about that a lot. I forget the numbers, but they're staggering how much of the Mississippi Delta disappears every day. And of course, that is because we have channeled the Mississippi. We don't allow it to, because we all want to be on the water. So we don't allow the river to, to grow and shrink as it would normally do with, with, with the spring rains. Um, you know, this makes me think, I'm, I always wander subject to subject. Um, I was reading about, was it Iowa, where there is such a water pollution problem because of the factory farms? which are, you know about the dead zone off the Mississippi? 
So the mis because of all the nitrates, which which cause bacteria to bloom. Um, so one of the other, sorry. Uh, let's see, how can I find this quickly? In North Carolina, there are, um, in fact, North Carolina is hog central. And hogs produce about, I mean, there's no pretty way to talk about this. Hogs produce about uh, three times as much fecal matter per body weight as humans. So the numbers are uh, staggering. Um, and I'm not even going to, I'm not going to show you the really horrible pictures. For those of you who haven't had lunch. For those of you, but okay, when we, when we flush nutrients down rivers, we get algal blooms, yeah? And they're very toxic. And there's a dead zone off of the, the, in the Gulf of Mexico at the base of the Mississippi River, which is, I think it's the size of Rhode Island and growing. And it's basically all those nutrients, fertilizer and manure, that we are washing down. Um, and we're, we're growing to um, just, you know, it's like everything else. We just accept stuff. So this is New York Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a giant algae bloom in New York Harbor. Now, I don't know if you have them here. You probably do. The one I showed you just before was in North Carolina, and it's just, these are dead, they're dead water bodies. Um, and again, you probably have them in South Carolina. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all about the nutrients that we, we're over fertilizing and, and of course washing factory farm manure down. The largest, the largest toxic spill into a waterway, the largest inland toxic spill into a waterway was a pig manure containment which burst during a hurricane into the New River in North Carolina in, I forget the year, the early aughts, and it killed everything in the river. Is perhaps the only I one in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say, I grew up on the bank of the Mississippi River, like literally on the bank, and we probably do have the spill. I, will, I mean, what I haven't said all day and it's been bothering me is that the meat industry is worse than Car industry. The meat industry is really and, bad. And we don't talk about it because people don't want to be inconvenienced. But what Iowa has really, really done well is we can't get elected in this week for a wind power because it's providing so many jobs from the, uh, the Dutch that have come and, and they're building windmills there. And it's a whole new industry, which is exciting. Um, mm -hmm. Is it the Dutch or the Danes? Oh, it's part of the Danish. I yeah, do yeah, and because. Um, What's the name of the biggest windmill? General Electric is the biggest American manufacturer, but the biggest, I forget, anyway. Um, yeah, factory farming, I mean, we all, you know, we all love our meat, and that meat comes at great cost. Cheap meat is a disaster. I mean, I know I'm in the South, and it's dangerous to go there, but if you want to do something for your children, stop eating meat. Or, you know, do it like, like Evolving Humans did it. I mean, eat good meat. You want to you, you do something for your children, eat meat once a week and eat grass-fed meat from a local farmer. I mean, you know, this stuff, that, that cheap bacon that, that we get, and it's so, it has such a tremendous... That's what those pig pictures are all about, um, is... Factory farmed meat. I think we have time for one more question. Mary Edna. Can you show us a few of the pictures that didn't make it? Into a few of the pictures that didn't make it into the into exhibition. This show? Yeah. That's um, a great way to kind of end, though, with that little slideshow. <clears throat> and he will be doing a book signing immediately after, so. Let's see. HF. I love my database. We love your database, too. <laughs> So should we only choose the ones that got HF2 or HF3? 
I think so. HF3, and we omit eyes. Sorry. I'm really a data master. That's what I collect data. So these are the ones that got these away. Are, these are pictures <laughs> that did not make it, that I really like that didn't make it into the show. Uh, and again, it's a little bit sad. This The projector doesn't do justice to the picture. And this is what, you know, as a photographer, it's really hard to, and Mary Edna, you can speak to this. Sometimes it's re you take something and it's magical and it's really hard to make a good print of it. And this is one that I've never gotten a print out of it that I, it, there's something very magical about that image and I haven't quite gotten a print. I'll keep trying. Yes, Ma'am, where was that? What are they? Oh, this of? one is up in the um, in the um, Cape Romaine. Mm -hmm. That's a really special place, Cape Romaine. I mean, they're all special. The Ace Basin is magical. Cape Romaine, Bulls Bay. It's right there, and it's. I mean, one of my favorite pictures is this this angel wing of sand in Bulls Bay. That one we've seen. This is earlier, that's a, a year earlier than the one that made it into the show, and you can see both of them are high tide, so you can see that beach is, is disappearing. Um, this is coastal forests up by Georgetown. Uh, again, it's back to that, you know, just getting there with the camera and then being lucky. The light was really special coming through this, these storm clouds. Um, another night, that one's in the catalog. I'm, I'm fascinated by that Ports Authority. And those ships move in and out of there so fast. They're, they're in, they unload, and they're gone in half an hour. Um, this is also at Longbrow Plantation. That's the Cumbie River wrapping around there. Um, and again, I should throw a shout out to the Downings who, who Finance the printing and framing of the uh, of the show. Also, it's in the Ace Basin. It's really special, the Ace Basin. Again, we're back at Longbrow Plantation. I assume that that is that they dug a ditch, and I assume that's just boom, boom, boom like that with some kind of machine. But I find it fascinating that path through the through the wetlands. Um, yeah, that's probably the Cumbie. It's in the Ace Basin. So what is all of that going over? Are those the tops of the trees? Yeah, those are trees, and that's just wetland, marsh, marsh grass. Yeah. You can only smell the sulfur. And phosphate. Yeah. You know that um, plants need three, I'm a scientist, plants need three macronutrients. They need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, and phosphorus is, that's what saved Charleston after the, after the Civil War, the phosphate. The, mine, the, the marshes around Charleston were completely dug up for phosphate. And these are just, yeah, that's up. I think that's um, Winyard Bay, no, Cape Romaine. Yeah. And the Cape Romaine Lighthouse. And these are um, friends of mine that are, this is the Gregory's, the Coles's, growing rice down in the Ace Basin, um, which is wonderful to have that, you know, that full circle of, of tradition, the rice coming, rice agriculture coming back. Um, I'm really looking forward to tonight where the museum has this arts and drafts event, which is local food and breweries coming and musicians coming and, um, and having this thing in the museum. I'm, that's, that's why I'm here, not for that. <laughs> it's true. It is why he's here. <laughs> but um, I'm fascinated by this resurgence of local agriculture. Um, and of course, this is, you know, I'm a, 
Um, there's, a, there's a long history in photography of photographing industry and making art out of industry. Um, there's a German photographer named Alfred Renger Patsch. He was one of the early Bauhaus photographers. So I'm, I'm always fascinated by the, the graphic elements of, of industry. Um, that's a paper mill. These are the, the ovens. Um, I don't know, the, whole, the, the process of paper is quite complex. And this is the paper mill that, that we see in the, the picture that made it into the exhibit. Um, and you know, it's a bad actor. Now, it's legal. We, so, you know, in a way it's not their fault. We as a society, and that's what my pictures are all about, we as a society need to make decisions about the direction of our society and then make laws accordingly and not bend to special interests. You know, like those environmentalists? Well, I think that's the perfect uh -oh. quote to end on for this. We're running out of time, but again, Henry's going to be signing his book. They're available in our shop, so you can grab one and come right back in here and continue your conversation with them. So I would like to thank Henry for sitting up here with me today. Thank you. Thank you.